Hey, good evening. We're glad you're here at New Life with us. Uh, thanks for tuning in and I hope that you enjoyed this evening's service. God is doing some great things in our church services and we're excited about how He's changing our life, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week, God is changing us. And Sunday nights is a special time for us to come together as a family and really experience the deep love that Jesus has for us. So thank you for being here. If you look at verse 1 in, in chapter 12, it says, Therefore we've been surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. And what this references is if we go back and reread chapter 11 in Hebrews, it's often called the Hall of Fame, the Christian Hall of Fame. Because here in Hebrews 11, we're reminded of some great men and women of faith, and it demonstrates them to us. And so the Lord is saying to us, if you understand that you've got this great cloud of witnesses around you, there are people who have lived this life who have gone on before us. There are people who are living this life in front of us now. Uh, I've often told you that I like to look at people's lives. I like to look at people who are older than me because I get to see that God has taken them through some things. Amen? We were at Brother and Sister Flora's the other night, and Brother Flora was sharing with us. And he may not know how much it encouraged our faith, but it encouraged our faith that night because we heard some stories that God had taken them through, through their ministry and their life, that prepared a witness before us. And so I look at these people's lives and I think, wow, Lord, thank you for demonstrating to me that no matter what I go through, there's already been gone through before me. There'll be, it's been going to be gone through after me. And hopefully I can be a good witness. I will be regarded as part of that great cloud of witnesses. Now, I'll probably never get to the hall of faith um, uh, I'm sure that probably won't happen. But the one thing I do know is that God will welcome me I, with great uh, anticipation uh, when I'm gone. Amen? And some of you will be glad I'm gone. But anyway, I'm glad that we have this, this witness in front of us. And it says to us not to be easily entangled. We're not to be easily drawn away. We're not to be easily pulled into things that will be a problem for us in our life. It says, be careful for these. Have you ever walked across the yard and walked through a spider web? I mean, it's one of the funniest things you will ever see. If you have closed circuit cameras at your house and you see somebody in the, walk across the yard and they get in a spider web, they're and dancing all around. It's like that's this ensnarement that happens to us. What happens to us if we're not paying attention in our lives, if we're not looking to see what the enemy's up to, we can walk right into an entanglement that will cause us to look fairly silly in our walk. Amen? And so he's, there's a warning for us to look for these entanglements. It says fixing our eyes on Jesus. We got to fix our eyes on him. See, the Christian life involves hard work. It's not for the faint at heart. It requires us to give uh, whatever in, in, in it, it, it requires us to give something to him so that we can experience the relationship with Jesus. We're talking about relationships on Sunday morning. A great relationship is a two-way activity. There's a two-way process in relationships. Relationships are not one-sided. Oftentimes, we look at our relationship with Jesus, and it becomes very one-sided. Jesus, give me the rent money. Jesus, help me pay the light bill. Jesus, keep me safe. Jesus, Jesus, do this, do this, do this, do this. It's a very one-sided relationship. And I think the Lord is pleased and he is honored when we come to him and we ask 
our needs before him and we lay them at his feet, I think he's honored by that. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is that we got to make sure that we have a, a communal relationship with him where we're also sharing our heart with him. We're also telling him how great and how wonderful he is, how much he means to us. I read something today on Facebook and it, it disturbed me. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's a hot topic, it's a, it's a sensitive topic, but I've never been one to stray away from those, so I'm just going to tell you. I read something on Facebook today and it said that our church, we have lost it because we no longer sing from a hymnal and that we have lost our ability to know scriptural doctrine. I think that's a sad commentary no, 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 not us. We're, <laughs> we'll go get him, Ray, if it's us. <laughs> it was a general statement to Christians that because we don't sing the physical hymn books any longer, that the church has lost its Christianity and that we've lost our understanding of the scriptures. And it grieves my heart because... When I look at the scriptures, when I understand the scriptures, they're not what I learn in songs, although I believe some of the newest songs that we sing have more scripture than we've ever heard in songs because they're taking direct quotes from the scripture. Uh, it isn't about the songs. It's about what I read in God's word. I don't want someone to devalue my Christian faith, my relationship with my God, my understanding of his word, because I don't praise and worship like you want me to. I want you to understand that as long as we are in this word of God, as long as we are deeply entrenched in what this book says, that's what matters in our hearts. And I agree with you, for generations we taught people songs, but we didn't require that they read the word of God. And it is my firm conviction that God is saying, get in my word and know me. Have a relationship with me. Have a relationship where you know my heart and I know your heart. And when you come to worship me, it doesn't matter what you're saying or what rhythm or what tune or how you're doing it. When you come before me and you worship me, I am touched and I am moved by that worship. Amen. Do you know sometimes I do my own worship songs? Now, you don't want to hear them. They'll never be published. They're never going to have a real tune or, or, or melody put to them. But there are times when I'm in my car and I begin to speak to the Lord and I begin to sing it out to Him. And those are hymns from my heart to Him. And you can't tell me my God is not touched by it. Because his word says that make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And you can praise him on the cymbals. You can praise him on the, any instrument. Just praise the Lord. It aggravates me. And that's why as your pastor, I don't want you to buy into this talk. That we are only as good as what happened yesterday. Oh, I love yesterday. I love it. I can tell you. When watching my grandma dance around a pot belly stove in church and seeing my grandma who wore her hair, she would take her hair and she would split it in the middle. She never cut it. She'd split it in the middle in the back and then she'd twist it around her fingers like this. And then one would go over this way and one would go over this way and you'd roll it back there until it was rolled up real tight back here. And then she'd pin in there and pin in here and pin in here. And then we'd get to church and she'd shake it all out. And I'd think, well, Grandma, just leave it alone. Let's just go to church. And she'd say, no, I don't want to look bad. 
But when the Holy Ghost got on my grandma, she didn't care whether the hair was pinned back or how she looked. She just wanted to serve God. She wanted to be with Him. You see, I think Jesus would say to us, would speak to our hearts. And I think He disciplines us in the way. When we don't see growth in our churches across this nation, I think the Lord is showing us something. I think the Lord does discipline us. I think the Lord is, says to us that, shame on us for being so set in our ways that we think we only got one way to do it. You see, here in the scripture, it says fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. My faith is not perfected by a song ever be that is one of our new words. It's not perfected by that. My faith is perfected by Jesus Christ. That's what perfects my faith. It's only in Jesus. And so if I get my eyes off from him, I am really in a skewed position or I'm in an entanglement. I am in a place that I have forgotten that Jesus Christ is my first love. I don't think we only do that with our songs. I think we do that in many ways of our life. Where we think that God has to do it the way he did it before or it's not acceptable. In us as Christians, we sometimes reject the move of God. What was new in my parents' age was not what my grandparents did. What was new in my grandparents' age was not what my great-grandparents did. And so we walk around and we say, well, I can't get into this new, this new way of life, this new Christian movement, this movement of God. I want you to know it's the same movement. It's the same movement. If you love God, it's the same movement. Because God is the center and the very essence of our faith. It is only when you've taken your eyes off from the central part that you get worried about all the other things. I believe in a father's discipline. Now, when I was 12 years old, I didn't. When my daddy would say, when we get home, I'm going to see each one of you. There are five of us. Sometimes my daddy didn't wait, believe in waiting until we got home. Sometimes it was severe enough, the hands would just start swinging in the back seat. How he kept that thing on the highway, I'll never know. But I understand the discipline of a father. And I'm thankful that I do. Because without that discipline, I might have bought into some of these things. But see, I'm thankful that my mom and daddy, as great as they were, and as great as my daddy still continues to be to this day, I am glad that they taught me this one thing, that my eyes should be fixed on Jesus. My eyes shouldn't be fixed on a preacher. My eyes shouldn't be fixed on people. My eyes should be fixed on Jesus and Him alone. Because the Bible says He is the only one thing that does not change. Methods, processes, our environments, they change. But God does not change. He's the same God. And if you want to experience Him, experience Him with the same heart that you once did. I have always been around elderly people. I fell in love with elderly people as a young child, and I spent most of my life with people who were twice my age, in some cases three times my age. 
My grandmother and I used to go to the nursing homes. When I went to the summer and spent with my grandmother, kids would be out playing and doing their things. Me and grandma, we went and sat in the nursing homes and we talked to old people. When I went to my grandma's church, I see it as clear as clear can be. I see Sister Webb right there on the second row to the left of the platform. I see Brother Bathis Smith right over here because men and women didn't sit together in church in those days. And I see Sister Betty Rose Smith back there. And I can see all the people that I admired and I loved and I honored in my life. I remember the first time grandma said, you're going to preach tonight. And I said, what? And she said, you're going to preach tonight. I've already told the preacher he needs to step aside because you're going to preach tonight. And so that night I went to church to preach. And I thought, what am I ever going to say to these people? They know so much more than I do. How could I ever bring something that meant something to them? You see, I'd bought into the fact that because... I was young and 13 years old, but I didn't have anything to say. They could quote more scripture than me. They had been through much more than I. But the thing that I remember is when I had them turn over to the 23rd Psalm. Every preacher starts their life out with that one. I remember having them turn over to the 23rd Psalm. And I could remember Sister Webb saying, Oh, glory. Sister Betty Rose Smith, she would begin to tremble a little bit. And you knew that because the feet would begin to move on that floor, the hardwood. And you could hear it. And I said, I want to talk to you about something God's laid on my heart. And I began to share with them what God had given me. It wasn't probably like they'd ever heard it before. But I want you to know those people that had experienced God in a way that maybe we could only hope to. Those people begin to listen with an excitement and a zeal and an understanding. And they poured into my life more than I will ever have poured into theirs. But they were willing to accept the fact that God's word was still God's word. It didn't matter if it was a 13 year old kid or if it was an 80 year old man it didn't matter how much wisdom I had gained it mattered that I was in God's word and sharing from his word in verse 4 when we get down here we see you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin the Christian life involves work it requires us to give up whatever endangers our relationship with God to run patiently and to struggle against sin. It requires that we do something. We will stumble, we will fall, we will look away. There will be things that distract us, but we must stay after God's calling in our life. We must follow Him. When we face hardships and disappointments and discouragement, it's easy to lose sight of the picture. But we're not alone. You see, many of us have already made it through life and doing far more difficult circumstances than I have gone through. And so when I look at them, I am encouraged that my faith is strong because Jesus said he would do the same for me that he's done for them. But I must be willing to do what that congregation that night did, and that is to understand it's God's word it's God's word. It's God's word. It's not delivery. It's not, did we do the same practice? See, I think repetition, and I think those things that are done out of ritual, those things that are done in, in, in just because that's the way we've done them, I think they make God sick. I think that it's not accurate. I think that God wants us to experience the newness of his love in the moment. Right now, in the time we're worshiping him. In the time that he is speaking to us. We can't hear God 
if we're so close-minded to the process, we will miss his word. We will miss his word. See, these readers were facing difficult times of persecution, but none of them had yet died for their faith because they were still alive. We look back at these great men and women and we see that they didn't receive their reward here. The reward came later. They were working hard, many of them imprisoned, many of them in jail, but they were declaring a new gospel. They were declaring something that had not been declared before. They stood against the times. Those Jewish people who said, you must do it this way, they stood against it. See, the very nature of our Christianity is not to be the same as we always were. It's good preaching. You don't have to like it. It's good preaching. The very fact of the Christian culture is that we didn't do it like everyone else. We didn't do it like the Romans. We didn't do it like the Jews. Instead, we got into it and we loved and we cared. And your word tells us that in those times, a family would persecute you. Your family, you were afraid to be a Christian because you would be persecuted. You may be sent away. And if your family sent you away, there was no provision for you. You would become a ward of the church. You see, some of us are still not understanding that Christianity will cost us something. If we are to really move into the move in the experience of God today, it will require us to not be like we've always been, but to be ready to be refreshed and renewed by the one living God, and that is Jesus Christ. I look at this and it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. Some of us look at discipline as it's direct. The discipline when my boys would disobey me, there was one rule in our house. You obeyed me. (laughs) And if you (laughs) obey, if you obeyed me, you didn't get in trouble. Did you spill milk? Did you break glasses? Did you do things? Yes, because that's what happens when you're kids. But if you directly disobeyed me, you're going to get a spanking. I still believed in spanking. I still believe in spanking. But if I said, don't do this, and you did it, it was a call to my bedroom. (laughs) And they knew it. And all I had to say is, I'll meet you in the bedroom. About 10 minutes. I wanted to give myself time to cool down. I wanted to pray about what I was about to do. Because nothing hurts more than hurting one of your children. I hated it. I can remember going to my dad. My dad seemed to enjoy it. (laughs) The more he hit us, the more he smiled. And I thought, well, how could he enjoy that so much? The first time I had to spank one of my boys, it hurt. And I can remember saying, Daddy, that feels so bad. And he said, that's how you know it's right, son. If you enjoyed it or it felt good, something would be wrong. You see, I think it grieves God's heart to have to discipline us. There's that direct discipline when we get in his word and we see that he's telling us something and we feel disciplined or reproached by him. But there's also, I think, a discipline that comes from our understanding. See, there are many things that my dad never knew I did. But I understood the discipline from it. There were things that he still doesn't know I did. But I was disciplined from it. Because I felt the shame. I felt the disappointment. I also reaped the rewards of my disobedience. I think the church 
not our church, the church in the United States of America, around the world, we are reaping a sign of disobedience. We are reaping a sign of disobedience because we are saying to God, you don't know how to do this, God. It does grieve my heart when I see that good people who love God with all of their heart refuse to recognize the move of God in today. Today. Seven people raised their hand this morning. I'd like to go home and say that's because I'm such a great orator. But the truth is I'm not. The truth is that God spoke to their hearts. And he changed them. See, every good and perfect gift comes from my Father. So when he renews and restores someone's life, he wouldn't be doing that in our midst if he wasn't pleased. God's not disciplining us, but he's showing us the rewards of our hard work as a church. My son... When you are reproved by him, I'm sorry, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for the discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? I knew the spankings in my room would make my boys good boys. I knew teaching them to be obedient would be important in all of their life. I taught them hymns. The one thing about my boys is they know the words to every hymn there is in that book. I taught them that. And then I had to learn to teach them something after the Lord reproved me. I too had begun to teach my children that God had to move the way I told him to move. And I remember the silent time. I was quiet and still before God. Part of my rules in my home, you couldn't listen to any ungodly music. So if it didn't, if it wasn't Christian music, you weren't allowed to listen to it. And anything that wasn't Christian was anything that wasn't Southern country gospel. I really was that silly. I begin to hear my children sing songs that lifted up God. I heard them quoting more scripture than I had taught them or that they had learned in Bible quiz. They were no longer singing the songs that I wanted them to sing. Remember Jonathan asked me one time, he said, Dad, would you take me and Corinne over to see, I think it was Striper. You remember? I didn't like one moment of it. In fact, my kids, they ran to the front. (laughs) They stood in front of those big speakers where it was making my heart pound out of my chest. 
I was still young. I mean, I'm 55 years old now, 56 years old. And so I'm still relatively young. And so you think back 25 years ago, I was still a young man. But see, I'd put God in this place that God couldn't be in that. Then I watched that night as they gave an altar call. And it had more conviction in that place than I'd ever seen in church. I saw young people coming from their pews. I saw them kneeling and praying. I saw them crying out before God. And I felt the discipline come over me. I felt God say to me, Son, you've got to trust me. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. This word came back to me tonight because I was thinking about what a blessed man I am. That my kids love God and they serve him and they don't care who comes along with them. They serve him. They don't serve him like I did. Thank God. They serve him with a zest and a zeal, an excitement and a love and a grace that I frankly didn't have for much of my life because I had adopted the same legalistic same critical, same spirit. And as I thought about that today, I thought, Lord, if I had not listened to the discipline that you provided in my own life, then you say that I am illegitimate and I am without father. I am an illegitimate child and I am not called yours. That means something to me. says we have earthly fathers who discipline us and we respected them shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live and live for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them but he dips, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness See, it would be weird if I said, John, I'll see you in my room in 15 minutes. He's 30 years old. <laughs> now, I will tell you the one thing about Jonathan that was different than Jordan. When I would call John to the room, he would immediately go over to the bed and he would lay down. He didn't want to hear me talk about it. He didn't want me to explain anything. Just hit me and be done. <laughs> Our process was, I would explain to them why we were here, why it grieved me to be here, and why I never want to be here again for this circumstance. I would spank them, and then I'd hold them in my arms, and I would tell them how much I love them. I'm thankful that my Lord picked me up that day. And he said, son, I've shown you something here. I never want you to have that critical spirit where you believe it has to be this way. Instead, son, I want you to know that if a child, a son, a daughter of mine has a hunger and a thirst after righteousness, a hunger to know me, that's what matters. I quit judging people. It'd be weird for me to spank John now or Jordan now. My time was for a while. But the reward of the discipline is for life. It's for life. 
I watch my son Jordan now. Got four kids. <laughs> Changes a whole lot. But I watch him speak to his girls. And I remember, I think, I gave you that speech. <laughs> I told you that. I don't know why this was so important to me tonight. But it was important for me to be able to share with you this word. We as a church will be disciplined by God. We as a church would be held accountable for our actions. We as a church may be called in to the Holy of Holies and spoke to. It happens to me about every day. God has to have a moment with me and remind me that I am to be kind. I am to be good. I am to be faithful. He reminds me that I need others to help reprove me. That left to my own devices, it's a frightening place for me to be. But that God brings people along in my life that helps him teach me, guide me, and direct me so that I can be found faithful to him. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight the path of my feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Do you know what it's saying to us there in verse 13? It's telling us that the, the, the word therefore is a clue that follows, that follows an importance. We must not live with any of our own survival in mind. Our, we must live with the survival of all of those around us. We are responsible for one another. We are responsible to ensure that we're all serving God according to His Word. According to His Word. The readers here in verse 14 pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification which no one will see the Lord. We're reminded that they knew they had to be holy or clean in order to enter the temple. Sin always blocks our vision of God. So if we want to see God, we must renounce sin and obey Him. That means in our daily walk, we must obey the Lord. I don't know what the convicting power of God is in your life, but I know in mine, he's saying, son, I don't want you to be in this rut. I want you to be open to the moving of the Spirit. I'm not open to all kinds of silly doctrine. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, I want no part of it. I will have no part of it. But as long as we are lifting up God's name and we are following the Word of God, then sign me up. Because I want to be a part of a mighty move of God. I want to see God do something great. I want to see God move in people's lives. I want to see people's hearts in life's change forever. I'm tired of living as though we cannot see God move in our time. God is moving. We are blind to it because we are not seeing Him. God is moving. And if you can't see him move, it might be because you've been like me. You've put him in such a narrow spot that you cannot see what he is doing. They put blinders on horses so that they will stay that way. They're not looking. They can't see anything. They put blinders over them. I don't want to have blinders on when it comes to the Spirit of God. I want to see what God is doing across his land. And he's still doing it today. I told you you wouldn't be disappointed with the service tonight. And certainly God is doing some great things. I'm glad you are a part of it and that you got to witness it. Please feel free to come out for any of our services and be a part of New Life. 
God is changing lives. And I'm thankful that here at New Life, new life really does begin. So if you have any questions or you need more information, don't hesitate to join us on our Facebook page. Give us a call here at the office, or you can go and see our website. Thank you for joining us. God bless you.